Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And I have been so looking forward to this episode for such a long time. Um, but I do want to tell you that we only have one more episode of the podcast for the year. For our regular listeners, you know that typically about mid-November all the way through the end of December, I go on hiatus. I take a little bit of a sabbatical from recording podcasts and from traveling, and that's just how I refresh and recharge. So I will ask for your prayers during that time. I would so appreciate that, that we could just have some really sweet family time together over the holidays to remember the incarnation and why Jesus came. And it's my favorite time of year, and so I'm really looking forward to that. But we're coming back in January with all new episodes, and we have some really strong episodes lined up. I can't wait to bring to you. We're going to be talking with my favorite Bible teacher, Skip Heitzig. If you don't follow Skip Heitzig's podcast or listen to his app, it, it is just wonderful Bible teaching. He's kind of my go-to when I travel, keeps me in the Word, and I'll go out for walks and listen to his sermons. Absolutely love it. So he's coming on the podcast to talk about the Bible. And so I'm really looking forward to that. We're going to have uh, Don Vinoy come on, who's sort of an expert in the teachings of Bill Gothard. So he's written a book on the topic. It's been updated. A new foreword has been written by Ginger Duggar of uh, Volo, who has been on this podcast before to talk about coming out of that movement. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Of course, our good friend John Cooper is coming back, one of your favorites, to talk about his new book about wimpy, weak, and woke Christianity, uh, always an interesting topic there. And also uh, my friend David Walcott, who is an apologist who served as a type of research assistant on our new book that's coming out in January called The Deconstruction of Christianity. Um, very interested to talk with David about his observations studying progressive Christianity and deconstruction. I don't think I know anybody who knows more about those two topics than David. He has dedicated his life to studying these things. We're going to talk with him. Really looking forward to that. So I'm telling you about all of this because there won't be regular episodes. I may pop in with a Christmas episode. I might do that. I'm not totally sure. I haven't decided yet. I'll see how I feel. But um, I do want to also let you know that we're sort of beginning the stages of the soft promotion of our new book. And by our book, I mean my co-author Tim Barnett and I have written a book called The Deconstruction of Christianity, What It Is, Why It's Destructive, and How to Respond. And I am very excited about this book to come out because we have written, this is not the book that you would give to a friend who's in deconstruction. It's really not written to the person who's deconstructing their faith, but rather it's written to the family member or the, the friend or the pastor of the person who is going through deconstruction. It's meant to be a resource for the church to really equip the body of Christ to understand what's happening with this deconstruction phenomenon, this movement, to understand why it literally destroys the historical roots and the gospel of Christianity and really how we can go about responding to those in our lives who might be in deconstruction. There's a whole chapter in the book on advice, and we look through several different scenarios and relationships that you might have with people and what might be a good approach and how to use wisdom in these scenarios. And so we're very, very excited. The foreword has been written by uh, Dr. Carl Truman, who I can't believe we've never had him on the podcast. We're going to have to get him on the podcast in January as well, because he's one of, uh, in my view, uh, just one of the most important Christian thinkers right now. Um, he's written some phenomenal books. So you can pre-order that book right now. You can go Go to Amazon and put in The Deconstruction of Christianity by Elisa Childers and Tim Barnett, and you can pre-order that. Um, just, you know, might go off the, your plate over the holidays when you're thinking about what to buy for Christmas presents and things like that. So if you want to just get your pre-order in now, then you'd be guaranteed to get that delivered to you at the end of January. It comes out January 30th. So this is going to be something you're going to want to get for your pastors and any friends that you might have that have maybe adult children who are in deconstruction, or maybe you have adult children in deconstruction or friends or loved ones, whoever it may be. I've learned that there is no limit to the different types of dynamics and relationships that can be involved in deconstruction. So we're very excited that this book is finally coming out. And so this leads me to the first question that I'm going to talk about today, and that is, what is deconstruction? Because I don't know if you've noticed, but people define that word 
in a whole host of different ways. So for example, you might have a high school student who went to summer camp with church and they come home and they say, hey, I'm, I'm deconstructing my faith. And they might just mean I'm rethinking maybe some of the doctrines that were given to me. I just want to make sure that what I believe is true. I want to make sure that what I believe lines up with reality. I want to make sure that um, that that I'm I'm lining myself up with who God really is, and I want to do that according to Scripture. I want to know why I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and I want to live that out. And they might be calling that deconstruction. And so I always recommend that if you know somebody that talks about being in deconstruction, always ask them what they mean, because if they're talking to you about it, it's probably not what we're talking about when we talk about the hashtag and the movement that's happening online. And so if that's you, if you have a high school student who comes home, just say, well, what do you mean by deconstruction? And if that's all they mean, that they're just making sure their faith is their own or they're engaging some doubts or asking hard questions on their faith, I think it's a great idea to encourage them to continue doing that. Pursue truth and and follow truth where it leads. And you do want to make sure that you believe the right things about Christianity and about God. And maybe what your parents told you wasn't uh, the real thing or the, or wasn't true in every area. So we have to do that for ourselves. And I think that's wonderful. But I would also really encourage you to try to persuade them to not use the word deconstruction to describe that kind of a process. And the reason for that is because deconstruction, as we're seeing it manifest in culture and as it's connected to its postmodern roots, and I want to talk about those two kind of angles, um, is something completely different from someone who's just engaging their doubts or somebody who is maybe asking really hard questions or something like that. And so deconstruction, as Tim and I studied it over the past couple of years, what we've really learned is that deconstruction really, as it manifests in the hashtag, is not really about objective truth. In fact, it sort of depends on a rejection of the idea that there is this absolute authority on truth or there is an absolute truth about reality to be known. And so um, how Tim and I are defining deconstruction in the book is that deconstruction is really a postmodern process of assessing your theological beliefs not using scripture as a standard. So essentially what it is, is it's a shift of authority from objective truth and the scriptures being God's word to your own sort of um, personal conscience, what you deem to be helpful or um, make leading you toward wholeness and you're rejecting things that you're going to hear words like toxic and harmful. And so it's really important to understand that because in the deconstruction hashtag, um, beliefs like being told you're a sinner, being told that Jesus died as a sacrifice on a bloody cross, these things are viewed as toxic doctrines because they don't line up with what somebody essentially makes somebody feel good about the world. And so I mentioned that it's also a postmodern process, and that's the other angle that I want to talk about this from, and that is how deconstruction is connected to its postmodern roots. And we've talked a little bit about this on the podcast before, how we had the rise of postmodern philosophers in the 60s. This is when postmodernism really gained steam in our culture. You have people like Michel Foucault, and you have Jacques Derrida. And interestingly, Jacques Derrida is referred to as the father of deconstruction, and Derrida didn't believe that words could be pinned down to singular meanings or definitions. And therefore, for Derrida, the intent of the author had no more bearing on the meaning of words than the interpretation of the hearer or the reader. Now, that, that should sound familiar because that is how so many people are approaching things like the Bible today and even language. But then, and we talk about this in the book, there was a guy, a philosopher named John Caputo, who took the ideas of Jacques Derrida which is kind of hallmarked by that rejection of absolute truth, especially as it would relate to, to words and communication. Caputo applied Derrida's ideas to religion. And so we see the ideas of Caputo and Derrida absolutely all over the deconstruction hashtag. We see it even in the movements of progressive Christianity and, um, and things like that. In fact, the late Rachel Held Evans, as many of you may know, she wrote a book about— um, the inspiration of scripture before she passed away. And then her latest book was published 
uh, after her death. And that book is called Wholehearted Faith. And it was finished by a friend and her husband and released. And it was interesting to me how in this book, she appealed directly to the ideas of French philosopher Jacques Derrida, who is the father of deconstruction. And when we come back from our break, I am going to read you a, a longer quote from that book because I think it's really important to understand that even people, I don't I don't think from what I engaged with, I've, I read, I think, all her books except maybe one. Um, I don't think she would have called herself a relativist or somebody who rejects objective truth. And yet you have her and other people like uh, Kristen Dumay, I'll read a quote from her as well, who are appealing to philosophers who do reject uh, absolute truth, that there's some sort of a knowable reality. And so I want to make that connection for you when we come back. But first, um, I want to take a moment and tell you about our first sponsor today, and that is Good Ranchers. You guys know how much I love Good Ranchers. It really helps me solve a couple of problems. <laughs> the first problem is that I don't have to think about what I'm going to make for dinner. That's huge for me. And the second problem it solves is that I'm not tempted as much to just run through fast food or get something that's not very nutritious for my family. So this is the highest quality meat and seafood that you can get. In fact, I learned something recently that blew my mind. I've been buying wild salmon from a big box store for years and years. And I only learned recently that wild salmon is actually not wild. Did you know that? I did not know that. That's actually refers to, I guess, the breed or, or something of the salmon, but it's still farmed. It has to say wild caught salmon. And so good ranchers, guess what they have? wild caught salmon. And so this is a great month to subscribe to Good Ranchers because as a part of their Black Friday specials, you can actually choose a, a protein, a free protein for an entire year that's like a $500 value. And you can choose between top sirloin steak, salmon, chicken breast, or bacon. So you're going to get that free protein for a year plus $15 off your new subscription. So give it a try. Maybe this is something you want to gift to someone else. Uh, you can gift them with a subscription to Good Ranchers. If you want to do that, go to GoodRanchers.com. Use my code ELISA for free protein for a year plus $15 off. Again, that's GoodRanchers.com. Use my code ELISA. All right, so I, I wanted to dig into this quote from Rachel Held Evans here because I want you to see the connection between progressive Christianity and deconstruction with the rejection of absolute truth as it can be claimed to be known when it comes to religion and morality. So here's Rachel Held Evans quoting Jacques Derrida. She said, the late French philosopher Jacques Derrida had a wonderful phrase, impoverishment by univocality, that he deployed for, to call for a kind of reading or listening that seeks instead to amplify the richness of multiple perspectives. When we try to make a text univo uh, univocal or univ uni univocal, boy, that's a hard word to say, univocal, in other words, reducing it to one voice, we fail to recognize the full possibility of what it can offer. To interpret a piece of writing with the goal of getting to the point is to fail to recognize the wealth within and beyond it because it takes on new life and new layers when it's interpreted through the diverse lens of many. Okay, I'm hopping out of the quote for a second just to make a little commentary on what we've read so far. So in other words, according to Derrida and as amplified by Rachel Held Evans, when we come to a text saying this is univocal, in other words, this is one voice speaking, then we're actually diminishing the meaning of the text because we need to go to uh, a diverse group of people to help interpret, and it, and it will get more out of it. it. In fact, we won't even reach the full possibility of what it can offer. Now, listen, I, I just want us to apply this in a common sense way. Let's think about a, a letter that I might write to my husband. What if my husband took my univocal letter that I wrote from my one voice and said, hey, I, you know, it wouldn't be really reaching the full potential of this letter if I just see it as coming through my wife's voice. I need to, to see what other people might interpret this to mean. And that would actually, in my opinion, be moving away from the intention of the author. I have a specific intent in writing that letter to my husband. And it is, in that case, univocal. But I think as we're going to move on with this quote, we're going to get back into it, we're going to see how this is going to be applied to Scripture and why that's such a dangerous way to apply it to Scripture. So now she moves in. I'm coming back to the quote, and here's Rachel Held Evans. To understand the Bible and its meaning as clear and plain is to diminish its relevance to peoples across time and space and to fail to recognize that the Bible is anything but univocal. The same can be said of how we see, describe, 
and attribute action to God. This is important. Pay attention here. We impose masks on God, choosing to emphasize particular perspectives and downplay others, lifting particular understandings while minimizing others. Some of these masks ended up written down in Scripture, while others are lost to memory. Some are more literary in nature, while others can be seen as more historical. Okay, we're hopping back out of the quote so I can make a little bit more commentary. So she's commenting broadly on how even how we, you know, if we read scripture, I, I might do that. I might impose a mask on God, choosing to see things through my own cultural lens, or I might misunderstand something, right? That's fair enough. I would agree with that. That's why it's very important to keep the intent of the author in mind. And when we come to the Bible and we use good hermeneutics, which is the science of interpreting the Bible properly, properly. We want to ask questions like, who wrote the book? Who did they write it to? How did the original audience understand it? Because we know it can't mean anything today that it didn't mean to the first audience. It might apply in a slightly different way with um, things that we engage with in our culture, but it's not going to be interpreted in a different way. And so that's why it's very important to view the scripture as univocal. This is God's voice. This is God breathing his word out through human beings, which, by the way, does not mean that they were human typewriters or that they went into a trance and just dictated what God wanted them to say. We certainly see their personalities reflected. We see their cultural context, their writing styles, grammar abilities. All of these things are included in what we call the doctrine of inspiration. But what we're talking about is that the words on the page, that's God's word. That is the univocal voice of God through that human author. So, but and, and I'm fine with that when we talk about our interpretation can be wrong. We could put a mask on God. We certainly could. I've known uh, people who've interpreted the Bible in a horrible way to uh, oppress people by doing that. But here's where it gets dicey. She says, some of these masks ended up written down in Scripture. Okay, so what she's saying then is that those biblical authors ended up imposing their own mask onto God. And so that's why she's saying some are literary in nature and some are more historical. In other words, not everything that's recorded as history is actually history. It might just be literary. Okay, so let's move on with uh, the final part of the quote here. And so I'm coming back into this quote from Rachel Held Evans from her book, Wholehearted Faith, where she's appealing to French philosopher Jacques Derrida. She says this, the literary masks of God, at least the ones that ended up in the Bible or in other religious writings, do have a historical dimension to them. For each bears witness to the way God has patiently accommodated people's fallen and culturally conditioned conceptions of the divine at a particular moment in history. But I say that these masks are primarily literary, not historical, because I refuse to believe that God engaged in or commanded the violence that some Old Testament authors ascribe to God. All right, that's the end of the quote. Now I'm going to make a little more commentary. This is absolutely so problematic, um, dare I even say heretical, because what she is saying here is that the biblical authors themselves wrote incorrect things about God because they had these, these masks on. And the reason she's doing this, and she even gives, our re she gives her reason here, she appeals to a postmodern philosopher who didn't believe that words had essentially meaning, She's appealing to that, and she's saying, because I refuse to believe that God engaged in or commanded the violence that some Old Testament authors ascribe to God. So in other words, when we read that God commanded Israel to conquer the Canaanites, according to Rachel Held Evans, that's just a mask that the biblical author had imposed on the text. That didn't really happen. God wouldn't do that. And she's giving her reason. She's saying, I have to find a way to work this out because I refuse to believe that what the scripture says about the nature and character of God is true. And this is deconstruction in a nutshell. This is what we see all over the deconstruction hashtag. This is what we see with people who are trying to maintain the label Christian. And in the deconstruction hashtag, if they do, it's typically more of a progressive Christian or a more broadly defined type of spirituality. And uh, this is exactly what we're seeing with deconstruction. Now, notice she's already decided by her own conscience or moral authority what it has to say. And then she's going to find a way 
to make it safe because she refuses to believe that God could engage in any kind of violence. Um, well, I don't know how you could read scripture from Genesis to Revelation and not know that God is a God of justice. Sin must be punished. It must be paid for. But this is why the gospel shines like such a bright light in scripture when we see the incarnation and the life of Jesus and him taking our sins upon himself because we then get the choice to choose justice or we can choose mercy. And friends, if you have never done that, if you have never trusted in Christ for your personal salvation— don't wait any longer. Trust in Jesus. Biblical faith is trust. It's not enough to check intellectual boxes. It's not enough to say, I believe that this is true. I believe that Jesus is who he said he was. We must trust in Christ for our salvation. And sometimes I give the analogy of when I'm going to be traveling to speak somewhere, I have to get on a plane to go there. And it's not enough for me to believe that the plane has been engineered properly, that the mechanics have maintained it properly, that the pilots are trained, that everybody's doing their job. I haven't placed faith, active trust in that belief till I put my body on the plane. And if you have been thinking these things through, maybe this is the time for you to say, I trust in you, Jesus, because the scripture says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you're a longtime listener, I really hope that you will give that some thought and call out on the name of Jesus, because as we talk about deconstruction, and I'm going to answer a couple more questions about different kinds of doubt. Um, we live in a culture where we don't feel like we need God because we have everything around us, and that's a difficult place to be in. But pray and ask the Lord to show you your spiritual need for Him, and then call on the name of the Lord and be saved if you've never done that today. But I, I said I was going to read a quote from uh Kristen Dumay. And this is a really interesting quote because this is something that happened on Twitter. Now, this was back in 2021 where, um, of course, Kristen Dumay wrote the book Jesus and John Wayne. That has been a book that has led many people into deconstruction and promoted the deacon. I don't know if, you know, I don't think it was openly promoting the word deconstruction, but it has led to a lot of deconstructions. And um, people were, you know, she calls, at least at the time, was referring to herself as a reformed Christian and, you know, kind of saying conservative in some sense, but there was a little bit of vagueness around her views on LGBTQ and issues of sexuality and biblical ethics as they would relate to that. So on Twitter, Denny Burke came on Twitter and basically said this. He said, when I read your book, I thought you treated evangelical opposition to gay rights as a negative thing, but others have told me that you personally affirm the church's teaching that homosexuality is sinful. Do you believe that homosexuality is sinful? And so Instead of answering on Twitter, she ended up writing a blog post, and I just want to—I I, I want to show you the shift from objective reality and saying, hey, there's an objective truth that I need to line up with whether I like it or not, and going to our own internal personal conscience, which is what we see in deconstruction. She said this at the end of this article. She said, we can spend our lives asking what right belief and obedient discipleship looks like in all these areas, and we should— but I'm going to do so in conversation and communion with my LGBTQ brothers and sisters in Christ because of the gospel. So in other words, she's not necessarily going to go to scripture. She's not necessarily going to go to evidence and reality. She's going to get with people who have these particular struggles because, of course, in the critical theory mindset, they would have more of a moral authority to speak to these issues. So uh, honestly, the decision has already been made. Now, another interesting question that was asked to her on Twitter, someone asked, do you have any tips on how the average person can analyze power and cultural systems so that we aren't held captive by them? And so she responded to that question. She said, um, I should have a better answer, but for me, it wasn't one source, but years spent reading social and cultural histories, histories of gender, Foucault, Gramsci, Adorno, Habermas and learning to be curious how the world works. Now, I want to talk about those people she re referenced on how to analyze power dynamics. She didn't say scripture. She didn't say Jesus. She said Michel Foucault, who is a famous postmodern philosopher. She mentioned Antonio Gramsci, who is the father of neo-Marxism. She mentioned Theodore Adorno, who was a leading member of the Frankfurt School, which this is where critical theory came from, which sort of has blossomed now into contemporary critical theory, sometimes called um, wokeness, right? And so those were the people that she said that she leans on to learn these things. So guys, deconstruction, uh, that was a long answer, but it is not 
based on objective truth. It is based on a rejection of objective truth, and it moves into what someone's personal conscience says is the right way to go. And that's why it is so dangerous, because we don't always know what the best thing is for us. All right, when we come back, I'm going to answer a couple more questions. But uh, I want to talk to you about our second sponsor today, and that is Carly Jean Los Angeles. This has just become one of my favorite companies. It's a Los Angeles small clothing company started by Carly Brannon. She's a mama for it. She's a Christian, and she makes really, really cute clothes and really high-quality clothes. Um, it's actually introduced me to some styles I may not have probably considered before, but you can kind of see them on the models that she uses that are all, by the way, all shapes and sizes. Um, in fact, everybody on the staff will do try-ons, and everybody has kind of a different look, and it's just really, really cute, high-quality clothes. This jacket that I'm wearing today is from Carly Jean. And so this is a great month to try Carly Jean. I know we're thinking about Christmas presents. Uh, this is a great time because they're still running their Black Friday special, and that's going to run through the end of November, and that's going to give you kind of an unprecedented for them 30% off your order. That is an amazing deal. And here's what I love about Carly Jean as well. If you, if you sign up as a regular customer and you get the app, you can start earning points. So if you buy some Christmas presents for other people, you'll earn points, and that'll give you a discount maybe on something for yourself down the road there. So go to carlyjeanlosangeles.com. Use my code, ALISA, for 30% off your order throughout the end of November. That's carlyjeanlosangeles.com. Use my code, ALISA, for 30% off. Great deal there. All right, the next um, question that I want to answer is one that I see all the time. This is one I see on social media all the time, um, and I just want to address this. And the question is, why don't you have anyone on the podcast who disagrees with you? Like, in other words, I talk about progressive Christianity. I warn the church about it. And so people are always wanting to know, like, why don't you bring the progressive Christians on to have discussions with them? That seems unfair. Well, I will be honest with you, this question— it puzzles me. It truly puzzles me because, as you know, each podcast has a different goal or aim. And ours, we say at the beginning of every episode, it's to equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. That's what we want to do. That's what we aim to do. This is not a debate platform. This is not one of those platforms that we have all sorts of different conversations from people that are coming from different, um, you know, mindsets and world views. I, I actually love podcasts like that. I listen to several of those. But here's the thing, guys. This is 2023. Everybody has a platform. It's not like you can't get access to what the progressive Christians are saying and what they're thinking. Um, I choose, you know, you only have so much intellectual and mental energy to, to give to things. And if I were going to start doing debate, I would have to really concentrate all of my energy on that because I would have to know what the person I'm going to be having the debate with thinks. I would have to read all of their particular things and really focus on uh, what they're saying. And rather than do that, I choose to use my platform to spread the gospel, to defend historic Christianity, to expose progressive Christianity and other counterfeit gospels. But honestly, you can go listen to a progressive Christian. You can listen to me and you have a mind. You have a brain. You can decide who you think has gotten things right and who's getting things wrong. And it just kind of puzzles me that in 2023, people would think that I owe a conversation to anybody who disagrees agrees with me or everyone who disagrees with me. Um, that, that is just not what this podcast is for. That is not what we do. I have had conversations like that. I've had public conversations with uh, Lisa Gunger, uh, John, uh, Hawk, uh, John Steingard from Hawk Nelson. Um, I've interacted in, in uh, on the podcast with claims made by people like Pete Enns. And so um, I've, I've done some of that when I felt that it was necessary. But I don't owe a conversation to everyone who disagrees with me. And it kind of puzzles me when people think that I should change the platform to do that. And here's another thing, too. I've worked really hard to build this platform, and it reaches a lot of people, and I'm not for a second about to hand that over to a progressive Christian who may not have a platform where that many people are listening. I'm, I'm just not going to do that. I've worked too hard to, to build this, and I'm not going to just give that over to someone else. And so um, that's why I don't do it. Um, I have no plans really on doing that. I'm not saying I would never do it. If the opportunity arose and it, it seemed right, for the for the context and the situation, I certainly wouldn't hesitate to do 
that if I felt that it was right. But there's just too much to talk about to correct some of the problems that are in progressive Christianity and to promote that historic Christian worldview. All right, one more question that I am going to interact with. Um, we, we always hear about the problem of suffering or the problem of evil. Uh, if you've listened to this podcast, we've done whole episodes on it. And that's basically the idea. Some skeptics will bring uh, about the claim, you know, if, if God was all good, then he wouldn't allow evil in the world, or if he, or maybe he's not powerful enough, right? But if he is all powerful, then maybe he's not loving because he does, he doesn't tend to stop evil all the time and suffering. And so how do we reconcile those things? And um, interestingly, I, I pointed this out on a recent episode of the Unshaken Faith podcast with my friend Natasha Crane, and that's that really this question only works. You can only ask this question if Christianity is true. And here's what I mean. If God does not exist, if there's not a moral authority that's higher than us, then morality is just a matter of opinion. And so you actually can't call anything objectively evil. So when you say, why does God allow evil? Well, you have to assume the existence of God to even call something objectively evil. Otherwise, it's just your opinion. You know, it would be just like Mother Teresa's opinion versus Hitler's opinion, as Frank Turek famously brought up in his book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And so you really can't even ask the question unless God exists. So to me, this is really more of an emotional type of doubt. This is the type of doubt that that bubbles up not from lack of evidence, but from a personal sort of um, feeling about the goodness or lack of goodness of God. And so what I would encourage Christians to do, that if you're asking this question, wrestle with this question with God. Bring him into it. Um, talk to the Lord about it. And uh, this is, interestingly, of all the doubts that I've had, this isn't one that I've personally really gone through personally, because I, I just, I have such a high level of trust that God is just and that he's good. And there's a, probably a whole lot of stuff I don't know the end of that, you know, I mean, I can just look at little examples throughout my life of times of hardship. Um, but I look back at, at times in my life and I see what God was working in my life that I couldn't see at the time. And so if you just expand that out, I just trust that whatever's happening all over the world, he is sovereign, he's in control, and he's working it for his purposes. And I may not know what those purposes are. I don't have to know because I really, truly trust him. And so this leads me to, I guess this is more of a pondering than a question, but um, something I've been thinking about is, you know, we talk about the problem of suffering, but I think there's another one that we don't talk about enough, and that's the problem of not enough suffering. <laughs> okay, now I know that sounds weird, but if you think about so much of the deconstruction that we see, so much of this that's going on, it's happening in really affluent areas. It's happening among affluent people. And I mentioned that I hinted at this at the beginning, but who may not even feel their need for God because we are living in a culture where, my goodness, we can drive through and get a cup of coffee. We can, there's so many um, affluent things that we have access to. Even um, our poor people in America have access to government programs and shelters and Christian organizations and even government organizations that, that help. So we, I don't even know how to word it other than maybe it's the problem of not enough suffering. Because I was thinking about, you know, the person who is heavily persecuted, like in a Muslim country. Well, they probably don't have the luxury of reading a book on the Kalam cosmological argument. They just need God to show up. And they call out to God. And they cry out for the Lord. And God hears that and sees that. And they don't have the luxury of, you know, feeling like they can take care of all their needs because they're desperate. They know that they can't. And so this is the type of doubt that bubbles up in the context of affluence. I'd love to know your thoughts. Leave a comment below if you've thought about this as well. So yeah, there's the problem of suffering. Why would God allow evil? But there's also the problem of not enough suffering when we don't realize our need for God because we have warm coats and houses with heat and air and cars to get where we need to go and whatever else it might be. Um, you know, kitchens to fret over and, and all these sorts of things. And uh, yeah, so maybe there's something to that as well. So somebody might be going through what they think is an intellectual type of doubt, but maybe it's just because we're sitting around with so much time on our hands that we don't realize how desperate we are for the God of the universe. And if he is who he says he is, then he's worth trusting with the things that we don't understand as well. All right, I want to tell you about 
Our final sponsor, which is Seven Weeks Coffee. I love Seven Weeks Coffee. In fact, I've got one right here. This is their Ethiopia blend. Um, this is a pro-life coffee company. This is the coffee company that Planned Parenthood hates. And they even say here on the packaging, at seven weeks of development, a baby is the size of a coffee bean. And for the first time, the baby's heartbeat is clearly detectable. So this is a values-based business. It's direct trade specialty coffee with a mission to donate 10% of every sale to pregnancy care centers across America. And that's exactly what they do. And that's why I love Seven Weeks Coffee. And it's really good. I've told you before, I'm a coffee snob. I have this you know, fancy little thing I do, and it is so good. And I love that it's mold-free, pesticide-free, shade-grown, single origin. Uh, love it. Seven Weeks Coffee. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com. You can subscribe also to the Heartbeat Club, where it can come to your door every month. Sevenweekscoffee.com. Use my code ALISA for 10% off your order. Again, that's sevenweekscoffee.com for 10% off your order.